really delighted to welcome all of you for uh, our virtual lunch and learn um, on the dimension of Faust with our music director, Stefan Deneve, our director of chorus, Amy Kaiser, and our general manager, Eric Finley. I wanna thank you all for being here with us today. I want to thank you all for your extraordinary support. You have given us hope in this time, very unusual time for all of us artists who are performing live music for all of you. I want you to know that your encouragement, your words of support, the many messages we have received from you have been truly transformational. And I want you to know that you are inspiring us. I mean, we have uh, very exciting things to share with you in the future. But today, I'm really thankful that we're back together for this lecture that we had planned for you back uh, in, in um, early March uh, when we had to cancel the production. Um, so today I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Mary Pillsbury, for her support. And I also want to thank a, a very special group of donors who provided additional support, Spencer and Phoebe Burke, David and Dorothy Kemper, Penny Pennington and Michael Fiddler, Bill and Carrie Polk, and Phoebe Dent Weil. And I also want to acknowledge our 1920 Classical Series sponsor, the Stewart Family Foundation and Worldwide Technology. Now I would like to invite my colleague, General Manager Eric Finley, to uh, lead this conversation with our music director, Stefan Deneve, and Amy Kaiser, director of chorus. Welcome. Thank you, Maria Lynn. Well, uh, it's so very uh, exciting uh, to still be a part of this discussion. Um, the original purpose, of course, of this Lunch and Learn was, of course, to learn about uh, the Damnation of Faust of Berlioz and to lunch as well. And I can promise you today, we'll still offer you a lovely learning opportunity about this great work. Uh, unfortunately, we'll make no promises about the quality of your lunch today. Uh, that's the only thing that has changed. So you'll, you'll have to self-reflect if you have complaints about the menu. Um, but nevertheless, don't be shy. Feel free to enjoy your lunch. Uh, you're all muted, so we won't hear you enjoying that meal. And um, this is very much a webinar format. You'll only see Amy and Stefan, uh, myself, Maria Lynn. Um, it, but we do invite you to submit questions via the chat function. If you aren't familiar with Zoom, look at the bottom of your page there and um, feel free to ask us any anything that comes to mind throughout the presentation. You won't be interrupting us. I'll make sure that your questions get included throughout the conversation. And uh, we'll add on some of those at the end. And if you don't ask questions, you're gonna be stuck with the questions that I ask. So that's, that's, your, that's your warning. So please feel free to chime in at any time. Um, so why are we talking about a performance that did not happen? Well, for, for one reason, uh, one, we just all believe this is an amazing work and we hope you will get to know it a bit better in the free time that you have right now. And uh, the second reason is that we will be rescheduling these performances at some point. Um, Stefan dreamed about this cast and it's rare that you, you get your first choice of singers when you really go after the stars, but we did. And there's a great thing about having made it through some of the rehearsals um, is that these world-class singers, they hear the quality of your St. Louis Symphony. Uh, they hear that we have a great Berlioz interpreter and in Stefan Deneuve, uh, a great chorus, a great hall. And I can tell you that they are all very eager to make it work to come back for uh, rescheduled dates. So stay tuned for that. Uh, for now, as they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And uh, as you're satisfying your appetite with lunch, our goal is to whet your appetite for this not to be missed music whenever we are able to bring it back. So uh, with that, a big thanks and uh, welcome to our music director, Stefan Deneuve, who is uh, joining us from Brussels. So this is a dinner and learned for him. Um, <laughs> and Amy Kaiser, director of the St. Louis Symphony Chorus coming to us uh, a little bit closer right out of University City. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Amy. 
Okay, thank you, Eric, so much. And uh, since you mentioned the extraordinary quality of the singers and reaching for the stars as soloists, let me start, uh, Stefan, with asking you, why do we need stars for this piece? What is so extraordinarily challenging and amazing about the three leading roles or the four singers, uh, Faust, Mephistopheles, Marguerite, Brander, uh, that we need these stellar creatures? Well, good evening. Nice to see you, uh, Amy, and nice to speak with all my friends in St. Louis. Um, I've been missing you a lot. Well, look, about Faust, the role of Faust to start with is basically unsingable because somehow uh, Be Berlioz was writing with an incredible ly lyrical sense, but also in a kind of instrumental way. And Faust actually uh, needs to be able to sing a very large range of notes and uh, to sing extremely soft, some very high notes. So it is very rare to find the right uh, French tenor, if I may say, that has the lightness uh, uh, in the high register, but still can deliver very, very loud also moments because the orchestra of Berlioz is very big. And uh, uh, a different problem for uh, Marguerite, which uh, uh, is a, a kind of mezzo-soprano, it's not extremely defined, but which needs such also um, a poetic way of singing it has to be sung with a sense of text, uh, which is very special. So you need perfect French pronunciation. And the role of Mephisto needs everything. It needs just uh, truculence, it needs craziness, it needs just uh, charisma, of course, and a very powerful voice, extremely powerful. And we had all of that in St. Louis. We had a stellar cast, really. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, so how high are these high notes that uh, the tenor uh, sings. Uh, I remember at the one rehearsal that we had with the orchestra and the soloists, Michael Spires was floating out these high notes and it was effortless and we're all sitting there jaws dropping, you know. How high is that? Oh, you have actually uh, some B flat and uh, 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 even uh, at some at one point a C, and uh, it's 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 incredible because sometimes you have to do these high notes in duet with actually Marguerite, and uh, and you have to mm -hmm. not cover her, so uh, you have to be able to to be uh, really uh, uh, just in perfect control of your instrument, and uh, only you know one out of many tenor can do that, and uh, um, yes, we had indeed the best i think for the role the one that just recorded it in the new official recording the most recent one michael spires he's a friend he lives actually not far and um uh, uh and and i i think we'll we'll have him again because he was very impressed by uh, uh, the orchestra and you and me we remember something very touching during a real soul when he just closed his eyes and and he was like that in his chair on stage during the Last rehearsal we did with the chorus and the children chorus, and he was literally in heaven, dans le ciel, during the last part of uh, the National Forest. I think all of us who could see him at that moment, there wasn't very many of us, will never forget that. Uh, that was blissful, blissful. And all three of these singers are American. Uh, interesting that they sound so French. Yes, they do speak French very well, uh, uh, which is impressive, uh, actually. Uh, both, uh, especially uh, Michael and uh, Isabel, really have an impressive spoken French. Uh, and uh, I didn't speak long enough with John to test his French, because I pretend to speak myself a little bit of English. But, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, yes, you, you definitely need a control of the French to sing this part, because it's Poetry uh, is just a, a permanent, very subtle way of using the language. And uh, you cannot interpret that uh, convincingly without really understanding the very difficult uh, sounds of French. Like, for instance, let's make an example, which uh, uh, I always propose to the chorus, un bon vin blanc, which are the three nasal sounds. It means a good white wine, which is always good to know in French, but uh, un bon vin blanc, very hard to sing for uh, foreigner singers. Well, we worked at it 
to try to get it so clean and we worked very hard and uh, we learned so much in the rehearsal process, which we will use when it gets reset, yes. for sure. And by the way, Amy, for, by the way, yes. you speak about the three, Amy, you speak about the three main roles and there is a fourth, much smaller, but still fourth soloist role. But wait a minute, actually the main role uh, in Forced is actually one you know very well is the chorus itself. Yes. Uh, the chorus sings, I mean, al along the whole piece and uh, has a lot to deliver, a lot of different uh, moments, sometimes in smaller group, uh, sometimes in a kind of soloistic little group. And um, uh, may I say officially, uh, since the audience could not hear the result that you had prepared the chorus fantastically. I mean, really, the last rehearsal we did together, I was so blown away by what they could deliver vocally and also with their French, because you speak French. Well, thank you. Well, we work very hard at it and everybody loves singing this because it has so much drama. So uh, Berlioz called it a dramatic legend, légende dramatique. But is yes. it an opera? And the Metropolitan Opera tried to stage it. I don't believe it really worked. I love it in concert. <laughs> What do you think? Is it a concert piece? Is it an opera? What makes it operatic? Uh, that it needs opera singers? And uh, oh. would you care to address that? Well, definitely, I would say it is a psychedelic experience for whoever <laughs> participates in it or listen to it. That's one thing. That's uh, yeah. The second thing is uh, Berlioz may have invented Hollywood movies before, way before it could exist, because he had this incredible vision. Berlioz was crazy, he was nuts, he was <laughs> unreasonable, and, and had this, this imagination that was really literally um, uh, out of maybe, I don't know, opium, I don't know what it is, but it's just crazy. And um, uh, he had a struggle to define what was his piece. He called it in very different ways over the years. He called it, uh, well, fourth, and then he called it an opera de concert, an opera of concert. Then he changed for drame de concert, drama of concert. Then he changed again for opera légende, a legend opera. And then he finally settled for légende dramatique. But all that actually proved that this is neither. This is not really an opera because it's too episodic and it doesn't have really a kind of sense of narrativity that, that follows a, a, a possible staging. Um, and, and at the same time, it's not only a symphony, despite some very long moments which are only symphonic, it's despite some moments that are much more like oratorios, it's still always visual. And um, for me, this is really a special form, and that's what makes it so attractive. That's what makes it an incredible experience, is that there's nothing like it. It's just values. There is nothing like it, really, truly. That is amazing. Um, so, um, uh, you've mentioned before that Berlioz is crazy. Uh, <laughs> would you care to tell us how, in the music, that craziness comes out? What did he do that was wild and unreasonable? Yes, unreasonable. I mean, what is crazy to start with, of course, it means many things, but if you think that crazy means unreasonable, unpredictable, uh, extreme, out of the norm, uh, Berlioz is all of that. Uh, to start with, um, you, you have to imagine a, a young man, he was 25 when he started to work on a musical force of some kind and he wrote first eight scenes of force and um, he, he wrote this for so many different uh, type of groups uh, I mean the, the the eight scenes of force had some moments with huge chorus and big orchestra and then the last aria was just for a guitar alone yeah. and I, uh, I that didn't I should explain to everybody that these eight scenes from Faust were the uh, original um, sketches, basically. Yes. Uh, for, and, and then he left those alone for a while and came back to them and expanded them. So uh, as you were saying, the last one is just with guitar. So Yes. And, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and, and when he did 
the, the 18 years later, after he, he composed the eight scenes, when he did the full version, um, he expanded many things for full orchestra, and he asked, for instance, uh, for it's in the score, eight to ten harps. And, uh, uh, and you just wonder uh, 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 who, who reasonably would ask uh, for eight to, to ten harps. It's written here. I can prove it to you. You see it? And uh, <laughs> voila, here. And, uh, uh, and then he asked, uh, at the end of the piece, there is a, a, a piece called Dans le Ciel with a, a chorus, of course, a full chorus, and he asked for children to join. It's actually four minutes, and uh, it's only 40 bars. So really, really just a little moment, but a very critical and crucial moment. And then he asked, ah, would be great to have three or 400 kids for that moment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely there was not a big sense of uh, reality from, from his side. And, uh, and what is also uh, uh, fascinating from Berlioz is his way of using the instrument. He, he said at some point that he was a, a painter composer, that he, that he just uh, wanted to paint with the music. And indeed, he's asking for um, an uh, incredible amount of effects uh, during the, the, the piece, and, um, and, and I found that actually uh, really uh, uh, also very special of, of Berlioz to, um, to just create sounds that never, nobody did before. And uh, well, there are many reasons to, uh, to, to consider him uh, uh, crazy, but for sure he was extreme. Yes, so is there, you have not recorded this piece yet, have you, yourself? No. I wish, I wish I would. <laughs> I, I uh, sorry, really, uh, <laughs> but do you uh, have a favorite recording? Well, uh, when I was young, uh, I discovered the piece first um, uh, in concert. Never heard it in recording before. And uh, it was the Orchestre de Paris uh, in Playel. And uh, I was really shocked by the experience. I thought it was just, I mean, so special. Like for instance, I remember the big climax at the end, the pandemonium, when uh, uh, suddenly Faust is actually uh, joining uh, the, the Mephisto into hell uh, after this amazing course à l'abîme. And then there suddenly they scream and the orchestra explodes and the whole chorus, speaking about craziness, the whole chorus is singing an invented language, the in, supposedly singing words of uh, demonic creatures. And that is so huge. It can definitely compete with any blockbuster, uh, uh, just a, a Hollywood movie special effects that beats everything. Um, so the, if I may say my favorite version is this first experience, because I will never forget this first experience. But then I listened uh, later to um, uh, the recording in 73 of Sir Colin Davis, with who I had the chance to work. I was a pianist for Sir Colin Davis at some point in Berlioz, by the way, in Romeo and Juliet and Tedeum. And uh, uh, it was a great cast. Uh, I remember with Nikolai Geda, wonderful tenor who sings with a perfect French style. And, uh, uh, and the Belgian bass, by the way, Jules Bastin, Josephine Vizet, so great, great cast. Recently, when I prepared for our performance in St. Louis, I uh, actually discovered some very early recording from the 30s, from the 40s, and, uh, and I love them, Piero Coppola, because they, they really show as well a certain uh, um, authentic style, which always inspire me you know, to respect what is uh, the true, the true French style of music. Mm -hmm. So Stefan just actually, Stefan just actually answered two of our questions from our attendees. One, when, when he first heard the piece and, uh, and another recommended, uh, a question about recommended recordings. Great questions from Spencer Burke and, uh, and, and Michael Grayson. Um, Amy, I want to hear from you. What is the, what's your first experience with this piece and what is, what's your favorite recording? Well, my first experience was at the Aspen Music Festival in, and School in 1972, and I was a student 
uh, uh, conducting, choral conducting, and I was studying with John Nelson. And John Nelson is an American conductor who has worked a lot in France. And uh, at the time, in his 20s, he had done the New York, the American premiere of Berlioz's opera Les Troyens at Carnegie Hall. So he suddenly, he was passionate about Berlioz. And he was a young man, but he was conducting Faust at Aspen. And we were working on this in our conducting classes. And we were assigned to cover the solo parts and practice conducting these recitative free things. And I was covering Mephistopheles. So <laughs> I got to sing Mephistopheles, which I have never forgotten. And of course, I sang in the chorus in these performances. And I got to love the piece uh, way, way back then. And then I got to prepare the chorus uh, with the St. Louis Symphony, conducted by Michael uh, uh, David Zinman in 2001. Now, that seems like a long time ago, but those of us that were, were uh, in part of those performances nearly 20 years ago, um, I think it was 2001, uh, we will never forget it. So uh, I did know the piece fairly well from that experience and then of course built on that uh, to work uh, with Stefan on uh, this production here. So we were not starting at the very beginning, even though that's a good place to start. <laughs> now, I, I want to throw in another great question here from uh, Mark Scharf, um, because this is, you know, I heard this referred to as one of the great myths of Western culture, the other being Don Giovanni, um, that this story, the story of Faust was really an obsession for a lot of the great composers of the 19th century, uh, Franz Liszt, uh, Gustav Mahler, Schumann, uh, Charles Gounod as well. Um, so uh, the question from Mark is, what specific sensibilities does Berlioz bring to the Faust legend in this piece? And that's for, for both of you. Stefan? Um, well, it's very interesting because, of course, the myth of Faust has everything that could please romantic people. But um, you have to remember that uh, Berlioz knew some other version. Uh, he discovered, of course, the... the uh, the, the Goethe version, the most famous version uh, in, a, in a translation by Gerard de Nerval, who was uh, a French writer. But um, uh, he, he also knew Marlowe and, and other versions. And, uh, uh, and he was actually feeling quite free about the, the Goethe version. He, 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 he wrote actually some different aspect of it. And um, uh, uh, especially the, the end, uh, he doesn't like the, the redemption uh, of force that uh, that that good proposed, and so uh, he did a, a, a different version. And in Germany, actually, um, uh, when he performed it in Dresden, uh, he was very impressed by the orchestra. He was extremely happy with the performance. But uh, uh, in the press, uh, they were criticizing the Berlioz forced because uh, because it was uh, it was not actually respecting the end of. Uh, uh, of, of Goethe. And it's very interesting, <laughs> when I was uh, a, a young conductor a long time ago, I did conduct the Gounod version uh, in opera. And uh, in Germany, if you buy the score of Faust, of Gounod, actually the title is changed for Margareta, uh, because, and I was very kind of puzzled in Germany. I was, in, I was conducting actually uh, in the Deutsche am Rhein in Dusseldorf. Um, and then I was like, how come this score shows Margaret? Actually, in Germany, they could not accept that actually a French man was uh, calling uh, a piece false, which belongs to Goethe. So they just literally just changed the name for Margaret in every uh, German score of, uh, uh, of false, of Gounod. <laughs> That's interesting. One of the things you shared with us weeks ago when we were working on this was that Berlioz threw in that Hungarian march right at the beginning. He took us to the plains of Hungary, which has nothing to do with any of the Faust legends or the Faust <laughs> legends. Uh, so he immediately just decided he was going to change the scene. Uh, is that, I, I forget, 
uh, tell no, us. You're right, you're right. No, no he, he did compose actually a, a, a piece at the same time as he ro ro worked on the, on, the, on the main version of Foz. Uh, and this Hungarian march, which by the way is a, is a, is a march that exists, there is a list version of it. And uh, you know, this famous many people believe it's actually from Berlioz, the melody. Actually, the melody is not from Berlioz. It's an oh. original Hungarian melody, but he orchestrated it in such a brilliant way that it became a hit right away. And he made that melody, if not by him, he made it famous, basically. And, uh, um, and, and so because of that success, he just thought it would be great to include it uh, in Dimension of Faust and then invented that, uh, that Faust would be just traveling in Hungary a little bit because in Hungary, because voila. And uh, that's what <laughs> it is. So I want to chime in here with another question. Um, you know, Spencer uh, Burke also uh, has pointed out that uh, the tenor is from Missouri. Yes, Michael indeed is from Missouri. Very small town, uh, grew up doing uh, musical theater. Um, and uh, this, this actually reminds me of another question, which is asked a little bit uh, later, which is, um, uh, it was asked, what is the staging going to be like? And, and we were actually, uh, we were planning a concert version of the piece. So I wanted to hear, um, you know, we talked about how he labeled it, uh, uh, you know, a dramatic legend, but I want to hear from each of you. Um, do you prefer the concert version of the piece or do you, have you seen a really convincing uh, staging of, of the work that you like? So you want to start, Amy or me? I... Okay, well, uh, I will chime in just to say that I, it, I love this piece with opera singers in the solo roles because uh, they can uh, relate to each other in a very dramatic and meaningful way by standing at the front of the stage and singing. Uh, and um, the chorus, we had nothing planned to stage there. And Berlioz stages a lot of things just by using special effects, by having uh, the children at a distance from the chorus and separations and a tremendous variety of scenes. I was very disappointed by the Metropolitan Opera staging of it, which was basically done, I think, for video with little squares, kind of like Zoom. They imagined Zoom before it actually happened. And uh, <laughs> uh, I saw it live at the Opera House. It works pretty well on film, but it doesn't work when it's live. And at intermission, people were chatting in the elevator about if I see another thing with little squares, I'm going to just scream. So um, the music itself has so much drama. And um, I think that comes out in what the way, precisely the way we were planning to do it. Look, uh, it reminds me a little anecdote. Uh, our dear friend, John Williams, the composer, uh, told me actually that, of course, in his life, he's been often frustrated because he, he wrote very, very refined, very delicate music. And then when it was mixed with the sound effect of the movie, especially in Star Wars, with all the explosion and sounds of laser or whatever, um, you could barely uh, hear the, the music. And he said to me, you know, the music, the visual always overpowers the music, actually. Um, but what is interesting, is that if you do the opposite, so if you actually just uh, hear the music, if you close your eyes or if you just look at people doing music, then you can actually let your imagination go much further than you could, I mean, uh, uh, I've realized uh, without the, the, the power of music. I believe in the power of music to create something special. I, I have a, another little uh, reflection is that, um, let's face it, um, uh, many of uh, interprets uh, of classical music are not uh, beautiful, are not handsome by kind of model standard, you know, and we sweat and we have sometimes <laughs> terrible hair, if you see <laughs> what I mean. And uh, uh, extra, anyway, if somebody, male or female, is making music, is 
inside the music, is really expressing music, this person is becoming actually beautiful and you can sustain looking for hours uh, somebody who in an objective way is not a beautiful person to look at. And uh, that's what music does. Music creates some visual worlds that are really more, more imaginative and more beautiful than you can just uh, uh, create. And uh, therefore, I totally believe in concert version for not only actually strange pieces, I mean, like this dimensional force, but even for opera. Because personally, I've been so often disturbed by the anecdote, you know, when you have uh, an amazing, an amazing Parsifal or whatever, uh, uh, you know, moment, and uh, and then you have a swan, and then you see that, ah, okay, like you, this uh, singer or this actor, this costume is not perfect, or there is like uh, an effect that is just not beautiful with the light, so, and then suddenly you you disconnect with the music. So I so love when I'm able to look at people making music and just make my own staging, my own imagination. I think it's much, power, much more powerful. It's even a genre in itself. I think this is really opera and concert are an experience which is not a concert, not an opera. It's something which is, I think, very special and very precious, and I believe in it. And I'm gonna add to that, uh, that uh, one of the things I love about Faust is uh, that the music transports you through time and space. There are no set changes, which means there are no bad set changes. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, there are no impossible set changes, like Wagner operas put demands on set designers that can't be met uh, or couldn't be met in the 19th century. And Berlioz also, like the Auerbach cellar scene when all the men are getting drunk and Faust wants to leave and Mephistopheles says, okay, you don't like this, we'll go somewhere else. And immediately the orchestra changes and the set changes, but you, you're hearing it and it is so powerful, you don't need to see anything. It's all in the mind. Yes. And there is one beautiful phrase, I think from Confucius, Confucius if I'm not mistaken, uh, which I love, which says like, my finger points to the moon and too bad for the people looking at my finger. And uh, what, 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 what it means, I think, is that you can really make people just believe they see the moon just because you point to something and uh, and even if the moon is not there, if you have the right gesture, you know, as a conductor, sometimes I try to do something like that. I try to make people believe something exists which actually is not there, but you hear it because there is the power of, uh, of suggestion, of imagination. You know, it's a kind of collective hypnotic effect, which I believe in music. So I, I think it's interesting also that, you know, any any staging of the work that, that I'm aware of, often you'll, you'll go back and you read reviews of them and every one of them is quite critical. Uh, maybe there are aspects that, you know, uh, mentions of how excellent the cast was or, oh, uh, this, was, this was an interesting depiction of, of the story, but never quite complimentary. Um, so I think this would also, uh, add to uh, add a bit to your feelings is that uh, you know it's it's a very difficult work uh, to stage and stage well and to stage in a way that you know meets the imagination that one might have uh, in the music just speaking for itself I have um, two more things quickly to interject about that. One is that in an opera house, you have a pit and the orchestra is in a pit and it never can sound quite the same as with the orchestra on the stage ever. So uh, that is another thing. And visually the focus is on the orchestra. And the other thing is that, yes, there are great opera choruses that can sound dramatic, but um, often, uh, it's that's one of the fun things for us when we were working on this to have eight characters and the the sopranos could scream as the descent into hell 
uh, rode past them on the horses. I mean, really scream. This almost never comes across on recordings. We had great screamers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the demonic language is terrifying, you know. So you really get this um, dramatic action on the stage where people can completely focus on it. Yeah. One of the things that I feel like we've learned very early in Stefan's tenure, I'm going to make him blush for a second here. If you heard his performances of uh, Fantastique, Symphony Fantastique of Berlioz last year, you'll know that Stefan is a fabulous dramatist with music. And, and really sometimes, you know, listening to the rehearsals of this work, I just thought to myself like, oh, it'd be too much. This is enough. I just want to hear the music. So, um, Really, I, I think uh, I encourage you all, you know, uh, when this gets rescheduled, tell your friends it will be a not to be um, missed event. Along those lines, we, I see a question here from uh, Carolyn Hinges uh, for Stefan. What other operas in concert would you like to perform in St. Louis? Oh, my God. I mean, uh, thank you, Carly, for this question. Uh, you, you will make me salivate about all my operatic dreams in St. Louis. Um, the, the fact is we're lucky because your, the, the orchestra does play uh, some operas every year, of course, with Opera Theatre St. Louis. So they know as well how to play opera. They're lucky enough to do four titles or something like that every single year. And um, uh, believe me, I will really, really, really try to do at least one opera every single year. Um, uh, also, my background is opera. I'm, uh, I started my career more as an opera conductor. I was four-year Kapellmeister, so permanent conductor in, in a German house uh, in, in Dusseldorf, Duisburg, and uh, uh, I miss opera. So I'm very pleased that next season we have a full Turandot, which is a very dramatic one with a huge chorus part. That's why I also programmed this one. Um, I will always try to, um, to, uh, to do operas that, uh, that have, of course, a prominent chorus because we have a luxury one in St. Louis. Um, so look, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, dramatic opera, Otello, Verdi, I mean, which I love. Of course, all the Wagner's, obviously, uh, which are very special. I mean, uh, uh, I will name one which has actually almost no chorus, but which is, a fabulous one, which is Pelas et Melisande of, um, of uh, uh, Debussy. I love all the Mozart opera. Uh, strangely enough, when I started my career, I was almost like a labeled uh, op Mozart conductor because I, I conducted so many um, Mozart opera uh, in Germany and in Paris. So, um, well, plenty. I'm actually, if I may say, I'm a little bit sad that you, uh, you did <laughs> very selfishly and egoistly that you did already in St. Louis a wonderful Peter Grimes with David Robertson uh, that went to the Carnegie Hall even. I mean, really a, a great memory for the orchestra and the chorus. And uh, because this one is also a fabulous one for conservation. Uh, so, okay, maybe uh, if I'm lucky enough, it may come back at some point, but I need to wait a bit more. Very, very good. And Carolyn, yeah, there's lots to get through there. I don't. I. I we're gonna have to. Uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to get to all of that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But suggest some titles too. You know, I. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> curious to know what uh, what what you, Caroline, and 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 all the music lover want to hear. You know, I want to uh, serve you as well. So there's another good question here uh, from. Mark Scharf, and I don't know if I know the answer to this, uh, how many performances of the piece happened in Berlioz's lifetime? Um, you know, I don't think it was met with great acclaim whenever it was first performed, and maybe it didn't see a complete concert version until after his death. I'm not, I'm not sure. Stefan, do you know the answer to this? Yes. I know an opera version didn't happen uh, until after his death. I think it's uh, Gainsbourg, the director, the famous director of the opera in Monte Carlo, a uh, great uh, director who actually um, uh, created, actually, in a way, the success of the piece with uh, an opera performance in Monte Carlo after the death of, um, of Berlioz. But um, during the time of Berlioz, uh, 
he, he could conduct uh, two performances uh, himself in the opera comic. And uh, they were in December 46 or 7, something like that. And uh, they were not met with, uh, with a big success, unfortunately. So it was not to be repeated. And he conducted then uh, in different countries, in Germany, in the uh, in UK, I mean, in, in England, as the part one and two. So basically half of, um, of the piece, but uh, not really the full, full, full piece, if I remember well. So let's say anyway that the piece didn't uh, uh, have a lot of success, really. Uh, during the time of Berlioz's life, but uh, it became a big classic uh, at the end of the 19th century. Too bad Berlioz was not there to, uh, to just uh, enjoy its mm. success then. So, so much for this work and, and any work with large forces like this, so much of the work happens behind the scenes, uh, behind the behind the scenes before we even uh, sit on stage with uh, the full forces of the piece. I'd like to hear from you, Amy, just a little bit about how you begin to prepare the chorus for uh, such a massive work like this. Well, first of all, uh, we build on our experience. There are a number of singers who did participate in the performance that we did here nearly 20 years ago. So, um, you're building on the experience of the singers. Uh, we have electronic learning files, especially for language, because one of the biggest challenges for this, for the chorus, is to sing in French, especially with a French conductor. Uh, so we uh, were really wanting to rise to that standard, and I coached, I coached it myself, and I made sure to coach my own uh, work with, with Stefan um, and learned a number of wonderful new things that I had not known about French diction. So we uh, worked on that, everyone individually. And then the main other challenge is uh, twofold. One, you have to have enough tenors and basses because uh, half of the, more than half of the singing is for men's chorus alone, sometimes even double men's chorus at the end of part two. Uh, so you really have to have power and confidence and a beautiful sound for that. And then you have eight different characters that the chorus has. They start out with peasants, uh, playful in the countryside, then there's a, a church scene, so they're a church chorus, then they, the men are in the, the beer cellar getting drunk and uh, raising havoc, then they're all servants of Mephistopheles seducing Faust, then they're servants of Mephistopheles taunting Faust. Then they're the neighbors of Marguerite making fun of her. And then the men are demons and then everyone goes to heaven. So uh, <laughs> it's um, a tremendous challenge dramatically. And I use all the talent of the singers in, that are in our chorus who have experience with opera and with musical theater and that is one of the things that makes our symphony chorus so special. And that makes them stand out from all the recordings that I have heard, some of which have excellent choruses, but they can't scream. They can't sound demonic. When they sing laughter, it just sounds like church music. I, I'm astonished. So um, we made it, I believe, something truly exciting and dramatic and uh, I'm so proud of the singers for all that, and we won't forget. <laughs> well, I, I think we agree with you. And um, Stefan, I want to ask you, you know, you spent a lot of time with the soloists, uh, you know, before the first uh, rehearsal with the orchestra, including with one of them. You worked together a little bit before you yeah. even got to St. Louis together. Tell us about what you're working on in these, these meetings at the, uh, at the piano with the soloists. Yes, it happens that Isabel Leonard was also my soloist about a month and a half before our performances in uh, St. Louis. 
in Philadelphia of another opera, which I also love, by the way, another one I want to do at some point, uh, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges of Maurice Ravel. And uh, so she was L'Enfant in, in Philadelphia. And then uh, we spent time together working, preparing for St. Louis during that week in Philadelphia. Uh, which was great because I used to be a pianist. I don't know if people know, but uh, when I was at the Conservatoire de Paris, I, uh, um, I was also studying piano and coaching and accompaniment. And uh, uh, to earn money, because uh, I needed that, uh, I actually became, lucky me, uh, the pianist of the Orchestre de Paris uh, and, and Orchestre de Paris chorus, great, great, great chorus. And, uh, and so I, I rehearsed actually with the soloist and with uh, with the chorus uh, this piece and uh, uh, I can't resist by the way to show you that the score I was planning to conduct uh, uh, with in Saint Louis is actually a score that the chorus the Paris the chorus of the orchestra de Paris offered me I was very young I was 22 when I uh, stopped there uh, uh, and uh, uh, and they 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 actually offered me a, a beautiful score which is here and they they had put my name as you can see in silver oh. I will be touch so under the second volume as well and then what was very touching is they they uh, they all uh, wrote you know um things uh, to to wish me luck with wow. my with my conducting career and we had actually a professional uh, cartoonist in um, in the chorus and the 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 Amy Kaiser at the time of the orchestra of the Paris chorus was a very famous man, Sir Arthur Oldham, uh, uh, a Scottish person, uh, full like Amy of passion, full of uh, imagination, um, and uh, uh, and and actually here is a something that was offered then. So it is Arthur Oldham, this kind of Scottish, uh, and he says. Uh, good luck and fly high, Stefan. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to wish me luck, uh, you see, Kerr de l'Orchestre de Paris, it's written here. Uh, and uh, well, that's supposed to be me. And, <laughs> um, and, and to answer your question now, uh, it was great to be a pianist again in Philadelphia and to work with, um, with Isabel. Uh, for Isabel Leona, it would, have been the, it would have been the first time she performed it um, on stage. And she was so well prepared. Her French was wonderful. So what we had to do only was to uh, work on some dramatic effect and timing. Because as you know, like in uh, comedy, in acting, in whatever, and in music, timing is key. And uh, uh, so we, we, I remember we, we worked on the, uh, the first entrance of Marguerite just I asked her to even not breathe, to just surprise. <gasps> to, uh, and, uh, um, and we work on this kind of uh, uh, theatrical, actually, um, aspect of the score. And then when I was in St. Louis, I worked with Michael Spires. I know him because we uh, performed and actually even did a DVD together in Barcelona of um, mm. a kind of man of uh, Offenbach uh, with Michael Spires. So he's, a, he's an old friend. And uh, uh, John Relaya, the, 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 the bass was uh, my first encounter with him, fantastic as well. And so when we worked together uh, uh, in St. Louis, just with the piano, the, the goal was to just get in sync, that it become very fluid, you know, uh, it's very like a theater play. I feel that I'm a stage director. I just try to uh, uh, use the, the music, of course, to, uh, to, to make those characters alive. And, uh, and I'm also bothering them a lot with um, French pronunciation because uh, uh, it does hurt my ear if it's not totally perfect. And I'm a perfectionist, I'm afraid. You know that. Amy. So, uh, so we would work and uh, I have some little systems to, uh, to articulate uh, better, I think, uh, with giving more legato, adding some little U uh in between consonants, you know, so uh, that's sometimes a bit new for singers. So we work on this. Uh, uh, style and uh, and that's what we did. We we worked quite in details because they were the three of them were at a very high level, so we could right away dig into a really fine tuning and uh, and theatrical aspect. So we have some questions about uh, orchestration here. A uh, question about the Ophiclide and uh, and about how um, this this one is from uh, Dan Brodsky, and then there's also a question as well from uh, Mark Scharf about uh, Berlioz uh, 
really being a master of orchestration and, and what standout moments um, there are in this work. What, what are those for you, Stefan? What's really unique about the orchestration in this in particular? Oof, um, so, I mean, basically kind of everything, of course, but I need to be more specific. Uh, to answer your question about the, the tuba and ophicleid, so an ophicleid is, is a kind of strange instrument um, which is, um, looks a little bit in the shape somehow of a contrabassoon. It has this kind of uh, uh, more vertical uh, tube aspect, but it's uh, uh, in metal, of course. And um, it was um, uh, used at the time of Berlioz a little bit, especially by um, uh, uh, wind ensemble, open air instrument, like um, more for uh, military uh, orchestra, this kind of thing. And uh, it, in the 1830s, it was, if I'm not mistaken, the transition somehow between this instrument and the new tuba. Uh, and uh, so it, what is interesting in this score, Berlioz asked for both. Um, he asked for an ophicleid and a tuba. So uh, uh, today we usually play with just two tubas, a smaller one and a big one. But uh, uh, but 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 uh, it's interesting. I heard in Boston, the, the, I heard actually um, uh, a player showing me, demonstrating me uh, the, the ophicleid, and it's uh, it's rough. <laughs> it's not very much in tune, but it's an interesting sound, uh, and I can imagine how it captures the imagination of Berlioz. So that's for the for the ophicleid and tuba. Both are required uh, in Berlioz's original orchestration. Now, uh, for me, um, well, the pandemonium uh, moment is uh, extraordinary because it's so powerful. And then there is something amazing is that uh, the whole orchestra is kind of singing the rhythm of the chorus together while the, the basses line, the double basses line is uh, just floating with a kind of a, a roller coaster, very fast notes. And the effect is that you, you, it's a kind of earthquake. You lose your sense of uh, gravity somehow. And I found that just fascinating. So that's one moment. Um, another one is a very famous ballet of the sylph, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and, and where Berlioz writes a, a diminuendo, reducing the orchestra little by little. And uh, it's so pure and so delicate. And then it's actually one of the first to really uh, uh, propose a precise number of players, very rare. So uh, it was written, in the score it's written 15 first violin, 15 seconds, um, 10 uh, violas, 10 cellos, and 9 double basses. That was the original count of Berlioz. But then in, in this piece, uh, uh, the ballet of the sylph, uh, he asks to reduce and then to be only 8 players, and then 4 players, and then 2. And, uh, and that's a uh, a very, uh, a very touching, touching moment. There is also something fabulous: is how, in the serenade of Mephisto, he replaced the original guitar. Berlioz was a guitar player, which is so weird. Uh, Berlioz was a champion of huge masses and very loud music. Actually, just was playing one of the softest instruments we have, the guitar. Um, but he replaced the original accompaniment guitar by all the strings playing. Uh, a Pizzicato, in a kind of guitar way, and it sounds terrific. It's, if you do it well, it really sounds like, a, like a, an immense guitar. And uh, mm. I mean, I could continue, I don't want to be boring, but um, <laughs> page after page, and maybe one of the most impressive orchestration idea he has is that he has this huge orchestra, you know, with lots of percussion, tam-tam, and, and everything, bells, and and uh, uh, many timpanis, and he has also um, lots of brass and everything. And anyway, but the piece starts with a simple line of violas. And the purity of the very distinctive sound of viola, I think just is so magical. It's so great that uh, you, you see this chorus, everybody, and you start with a very pure, line of viola and our viola section is terrific i mean uh you know beth and jonathan shu and yeah they just lead a fabulous really fabulous section with new members that are appointed i'm very 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 honored to have uh, uh, been there for that great moment of new new addition to the orchestra and uh, uh and they sounded i mean so good so 
I really feel that we started on the right track with this pure viola line. Well, Berlioz loved the viola. He's very generous to the viola section in a lot of his uh, works and even uh, Harold in Italy, for example, which we heard a couple of years ago. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up, but uh, I'll, I'll, we'll finish with the last question, which is from Ashley Moffat. Uh, is there any update on when the performance will be rescheduled? And all I can say to this is, um, you know, uh, I was looking at the history, the, the first performance of um, uh, Damnation of Faust was in 1936 with another Frenchman, Vladimir Goldschmidt. Mm. And I can promise you that the next performance of Damnation of Faust will be with our very own Frenchman. Um, and as soon as we can assemble this cast around um, uh, uh, all for the same dates, uh, we will be rescheduling this wonderful work. Uh, in the meantime, you'll have to settle for other opera and concert like Puccini's Turandot next season. Please, please join us for that. And uh, I, I want to thank, uh, before we close up, thank you so much, Stefan, for uh, postponing your dinner just a little bit to join us for this. Amy, thank you so very much as well uh, for sharing. We, um, we just wanna share how much we, we miss you all. We miss our audiences um, dearly, and we cannot wait to perform this work and many others for you. Your questions were fantastic. Thank you for those. And uh, I hope we'll do this again soon. Thank you, Erin. And, and thank you again to our sponsor, Mary Pillsbury, and to all of those uh, supporters who helped uh, fund this, uh, this lecture and this program today. Thank you. All right, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Big, big, big virtual hug. <laughs>